conservation divers and welcome back to our channel. Today I wanted to make a new video to talk a little bit about coral nurseries um, because lately I've received a few questions as to far as the techniques that we use and why you don't see the, uh, the kind of iconic coral tree that you would see in many programs that are in the US and throughout kind of the Caribbean being used in conservation diver centers. Many projects around the planet are using the coral tree method. This method was first pioneered by Ken Niedermeyer, who was the founder of the Coral Restoration Foundation in Florida and is now the founder and head of a program called Reef Renewal. So like any method, the coral trees have their strengths and weaknesses, and this makes them quite useful in some situations and not so much in others. So, while I support this method and have great respect for Ken, I wanted to make a video and talk about why the coral trees are not a one-size-fits-all solution in coral restoration. But before I talk about what I like and don't like about the coral trees, we need to talk a bit about what a coral nursery is and why they are used. So coral nurseries are used to help rehabilitate and grow corals out larger before transplanting them to a marginalized reef or an artificial reef structure. As the name implies, it is a temporary staging area where the corals can be looked after, removed some, from some stressors, and safely allowed to grow out larger before being put back on the reef. Coral nurseries first appear in the scientific literature around 1995 in a paper by Reinkovich. He experimented with adding a nursery step to the coral gardening process and direct transplantation activities that had already been going on since the early 80s. Then, in 2006, we start to see publications on the use of midwater nurseries in papers like the one by Schaefer, Van Rin, and Reinkovich from Israel. With these methods, they are able to achieve not only higher survival of corals, but also improved growth rates on the order of about two to three times that of corals on the reef. The nurseries work very simply by maintaining better growing conditions for corals by moving them away from a lot of the threats and sources of stresses that would naturally be on the reef. Basically, we're moving them from shallow coastal areas to the open ocean. If you move corals away from shore, you also are moving them from many of the land-based threats such as pollution, sedimentation, and nutrient loading. But moving them off the bottom and away from the reef, you are also removing many of the small scale stressors like predators, grazers, competitors, moving sands, and other annoyances. But of course, when we move away from land, it's generally going to get deeper, and corals want constant light levels. So we need to maintain the same depth no matter how far from the land we go. To achieve this, the nurseries float so that the corals collected at one depth can be moved hundreds of meters away but are still kept at the same depth. So, when we do restoration, we first identify our restoration zone, the area that we're going to be working in, and they take the depth of that area. Next, we build our nursery at the same depth so that we can move the coral laterally without ever moving them vertically or changing depth. This is important because while a juvenile coral can live at a wide range of depths, once a coral settles down, it becomes locally adapted to those conditions and acquire zooxanthellae that are most productive at those temperature and light levels. Any subsequent changes will cause stress to the coral. In this photo, you can see a coral that was moved up just a few meters in the water column. Now, the top is getting too much light relative to what it likes, and it has bleached. Moving corals up in the water column, we very quickly see bleaching and other signs of poor health. When we move corals deeper, it also causes stress, but it is not as readily apparent. Now, the corals are getting less light than what they need, and thus less energy. In this case, they compensate by using their stored reserves, leaving them less able to fight off other threats. Often, when corals are moved deeper, they do not appear stressed right away, but then succumb to predation or disease a few weeks or even months later, as they don't have enough energy to power their immune systems. So. With these facts in mind, let's take a look at how the tree nurseries work. Essentially, they are floating PVC structures that are weighted to the bottom or secured using stakes driven into the sand bottom. At the top, they will have a float that keeps them suspended in the water column. 
Corals are attached to the crossbars using monofilament line and metal crimps. Each small coral hangs suspended in midwater, where it has good flow for feeding, is getting plenty of light, and is removed from sedimentation, invert grazers, and other stress factors. All good things. The other great benefit that I see is that there is minimal area for the growth of fouling organisms like sponges and tunicates, which make this method very useful in areas with turbid or nutrient-rich waters. Some other benefits are that this method is cheap, uses very few materials, and can be effectively used in areas with strong currents or high wave surge. So it definitely has its applications, which is why it became such a widely used method. But it also has some weaknesses. The first being that it is hard to transplant the corals later on, as they do not orientate on any one side, and instead grow out in all directions. This is great for growth, but introduces weaknesses when transplanting two solid substrates later on. Basically, they lack a strong base to secure to, and either are secured using growing tips or are broken before transplantation. Again, introducing stress and open lesions to disease entry. And it kind of negates the whole purpose of the nursery stage when you break them back smaller before outplanting. But that is not the reason I avoid this method. For me, it has to do with what we discussed earlier. Changing the coral's depth in the water changes the amount of light it receives and adds stress. Corals that are growing on the trees are at a range of depths, as they are arranged vertically. It is unlikely that they were all collected from the same range of depths, and so are under some stress when moved onto the trees. This would not be apparent as they are being moved to an area of respite and will then adjust over time as they grow out in the nurseries, but it may reduce the growth rates. The real problem comes when they are moved off the nurseries again. Generally, all the corals from the various branches, which are large enough for outplanting, will be removed, put into a basket, and transplanted to another location, usually all at the same depth. And usually by eager volunteers who tend to get a bit myopic in their duties and just put, push forward on planting corals wherever they can find a spot, regardless of the depth the coral came from. So not only are the corals being put back on the uncontrolled environment of the reef, but they have the added stress factor of being moved in depth, unless we see less survival and long-term success. Looking at the success rates in the literature, it can be argued that projects using the tree nurseries have similar success during the nursery phase, but lower survival and success in the outplanting stage than other nursery types, such as the platform and rope nurseries. The platform nurseries utilize a PVC frame with PVC or HDPE meshing, to which vinyl tubes holding corals are inserted. The benefit to this technique is that the corals are all at the single depth, which is built to be consistent with the restoration zone, or multiple tables can be deployed to allow for multiple restoration areas or depths. This makes using volunteers during outplanting very simply, as you can just instruct them to plant at a constant depth and ensure no unnecessary stress is being introduced. Other benefits include that the corals have an obvious orientation and that all foreign and synthetic materials are removed and reused before transplanting. In my experience, we have very high success with table nurseries when used in the right way, and they hold up well to storms and wave surge. One of the other benefits is that we can adjust their height, lowering them during large storms and bleaching events. The second method is the rope nurseries. These ideally are all at the same height, but the sag in the line means there is a small amount of variability introduced. The nursery is made of two floating bars with braided ropes strung between them. It is the cheapest and most simple method available today. To attach corals, you just twist open the rope, insert the coral, and let the rope tighten back around them. Corals quickly overgrow the rope, and then the rope is either cut before transplanting, or the entire rope of corals can be wrapped around metal structures to make outplanting and securing hundreds of corals possible in a single dive. Once the coral is attached to the structure, the rope can be cut and removed. We have great success with this method. However, the drawback is that the braided rope can be an attachment point for biofouling organisms like sponges, tunicates, and microalgae. This means this technique work, works best in very clean and nutrient deficient waters. To get around this, some use the rope method, but have modified it to instead use monofilament line, the same as the tree nurseries. This makes a good compromise, and again is a method 
that is both easy and reliable. So, as you can see, each method is applicable in different situations and may change based on the area being restored and the level of training of volunteers and staff. But what worries me is the way I have seen the tree method used at multiple sites, where corals are being grown on trees that are secured at the same depth as the restoration reef. This means that all the corals are being moved deeper during outplanting, some more than others. Those doing projects in such a way might not notice any ill effects at a week or two weeks later, and they might even see the corals looking slightly darker at about weeks two or three. But after several weeks, it is very likely that those corals will succumb to predation or disease, both of which are higher in stressed populations. As such, I would personally only use the trees if I was working in a turbid or nutrient-rich area where I thought platform or rope nurseries would harbor too many fouling organisms. Second, I would ensure that the corals moved off are kept at the same depth meaning that care would need to be taken to ensure that corals moved from one branch are all moved to the same depth as that branch and not transplanted with corals that were growing above or below them on the trees. In summary, as ecosystem restorationists, we need to have a big belt of tools at our disposal. Like any tool belt, each item gets used when it's called for. If not, then it's back to the old, when you only have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. We want to make sure that our partners are using the methods that best applies to them in each unique situation and not getting stuck thinking that any one method is better than all the rest all the time. I hope that you have found this information helpful and that it has expanded your idea of what is achievable. If you have any experience with any of these methods or any methods that we didn't discuss, please let us know in the comments. We would love to hear from you. Thank you very much and best of luck in all your efforts.